Okay, so I'm going to give you a little brief history of Pittsburgh booze before we dive into the Wiggles story. So it turns out we've always been in the epicenter of alcohol here in western Pennsylvania. This is the birthplace of the pool tab, which featured um, debuted on Iron City beer cans and was, of course, developed by Alcoa. We are still one of the top cities per capita for bars in America. So lots to be proud of. And what I am proudest of is that American whiskey was born right here in western Pennsylvania. So Pittsburgh was settled by two groups in the 1790s, the Germans who were good, industrious farmers, the Scots who were good, industrious drinkers, and the two, they brought their skill sets together. The Germans brought rye grain from Germany, the Scots brought stills. The Germans are bringing rye because we've got lots of nice things here in Pittsburgh. The soil is not one of them, but rye is a sturdy grain. It can grow in shitty soil. So they put their skill sets together here and they create this new product called Monongahela Rye Whiskey. They get really good at making this whiskey here in Western Pennsylvania. So good that people all over the country start asking for it and paying attention to it, including this guy, Alexander Hamilton. So we are in the 1790s, if you remember, and if you just sort of close your eyes and imagine, Pittsburgh is the frontier. America's a very young country. We've just come out of this revolutionary war. And this guy is our Secretary of the Treasury, the nation's first. He's got to figure out a way to bring this young nation back to solvency. So he comes up with the first excise tax in American history. And guess what that tax is on? Whiskey. Whiskey. Smart. <laughs> Pepper smart. <laughs> oh, whiskey. Yeah, this pisses everybody in Pittsburgh off, right? Because Whiskey at this point is our economy. We are producing half a barrel of whiskey for every man, woman, and child living in America. This, at this point, our guy, the guy who we named a, um, the distillery after, Philip Wiggle, was a German immigrant. He was a whiskey distiller. He hears about this tax, and he meets the federal tax collector who comes to Pittsburgh. The tax collector asks him for his taxes. He asks him also for the list of names of everyone in Pittsburgh that has a still. Wiggle is a passionate guy. He's not necessarily the smartest guy, but he's very passionate. And he punches this federal tax collector. Now, this is Pittsburgh, so people here, there's a fight, and they get very excited. This punch incites protests and riots that last for four years here in western Pennsylvania in what comes to be known as the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, so Wiggle at this point, our guy, he's in trouble. George Washington is pretty worried about this rebellion. He is, um, it sort of culminates when the people of Pittsburgh burn down the house of this guy named John Neville, who's Alexander Hamilton's right-hand man on the frontier. At that point, Hamilton goes to his buddy George and he says, George, I need your help. These people in Pittsburgh are crazy. And he agrees. They were crazy here. This was a federal tax. No one else was behaving this badly across the country, right? So George Washington personally marches 13,000 troops into western Pennsylvania and arrests 200 men in the city of Pittsburgh in an event called the Terrible Night. He takes a few of them, the worst defenders, back to a place no one should ever have to go, Philadelphia. <laughs> and Wiggle, at this point, is charged with treason for his leadership in the Whiskey Rebellion. Treason is hard to come back from. It's really tough to get out of treason. Um, you'll take some ethics courses in your time at Tepper, hopefully. Treason is something you always want to avoid <laughs> going forward. Uh, okay, so there's only one point at this, one guy at this point that can save our friend Wiggle, and that is George Washington himself. He does pardon Wiggle because he does not want to create a martyr figure over this whiskey business. He lets Wiggle go. Shortly thereafter, Washington himself retires to Mount Vernon and becomes, for a couple of years, 
America's largest distiller of rye whiskey himself. So after the Whiskey Rebellion, Western Pennsylvania continues to produce the country's whiskey. Um, a, this guy, a guy named Abraham Overholt, he moves from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh and sets up what will become the first brand of American whiskey. It becomes known as Old Overholt. It, sail, it still sits on the shelves today. Um, and this is the whiskey that uh, the Northern troops are drinking and their rations during the Civil War. This is the whiskey that you would ask for at a bar after a successful day gold rushing in California. This is the whiskey that classic cocktails, Sazeracs, Old Fashions, Manhattans are built on. Um, so Abraham Overholt, the owner of this distillery, America's first big brand of distillery, he's a wealthy guy here in Western Pennsylvania. And he's got a daughter in, in this sort of dirty dancing turn of events. His daughter falls in love with one of the millers at his distillery, which is just like his ultimate nightmare, right? <laughs> Not only is this guy, does he have a bad reputation, this miller, he's got red hair, which means he's Irish, which is also a nightmare in the 19th century, right? So um, Abraham Overholt tries to put this relationship to an end until he learns that his daughter is pregnant, at which point he hastens a marriage. They move into worker house number two at this distillery, America's largest distillery, um, have their first baby, quickly get pregnant with child number two, who they named Henry Clay Frick. So Frick is born in the shadows of this distillery. He um, grows up watching his grandfather run this distillery, and he, of course, becomes far more interested in the alternative fuel that his very progressive grandfather is using to run this distillery than he is in the whiskey that his grandfather is making. So when um, Frick's grandfather Abraham dies and he inherits this distillery, he goes to another famous Pittsburgh family you may have heard of, the Mellon family, and he sells off this distillery to Judge Thomas Mellon. Which means that ultimately this guy, Andrew Mellon, inherits this overhauled distillery, the largest distillery in America. Now, if I were to inherit the largest distillery in America, like if I were to inherit Diageo, if you were to inherit Diageo tomorrow, we would be happy, right? That would be a good day. It would be a very good day. Um, this is tricky for Mellon because he is now the owner of the country's largest distillery. He's also our nation's secretary of the treasury, and it is the onset of prohibition, which makes him chief prohibition agent. <laughs> so he does what any smart politician would do, and he grants himself a medicinal whiskey license so that he can continue to produce the country's whiskey here in Pittsburgh throughout prohibition. Um, okay, so <clears throat> that was pre-prohibition American whiskey, right? When we started thinking about bringing whiskey back to Pittsburgh, we were looking at a very different industry. American whiskey was no longer uh, an industry of rye whiskey. It had become an industry of corn whiskey. This is what bourbon means. It means it's whiskey made from 51% corn or more. Uh, it's different in another way as well. So this is a chart that shows the number of distilleries in the country. So the x-axis here is years. It's starting at 1880. Y-axis is number of distilleries in thousands. What do you think this precipitous decline is? Prohibition. You can see we have gone from a country of having thousands, tens of thousands of distilleries even earlier than this to a country that has never recovered from prohibition. We have been living through the most boring whiskey landscape America has ever known for decades. <coughs> now when we, we started the distillery, and we started working on it in 2010, but in 2013, the state of Pennsylvania gave us data on where their whiskey, where their rye whiskey was coming from. And then I started doing talks like this, and they stopped giving me their data. <laughs> um, but at that point, 
So the state of Pennsylvania is a very important liquor purchaser. It's the largest purchaser, single purchaser of liquor in the country because the state buys all of the liquor for all of us, right? Um, at that point, 80% of the rye whiskey they were selling in their stores came from exactly two distilleries. Uh, MGP, which you probably have not heard of, this is Midwest Grain Products. They're located in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. They are the largest distillery in the country by volume. Um, and they don't produce their own brand of whiskey. They instead produce bulk whiskey that they sell off to other brands to bottle and label. And then the other um, distillery you have heard of, Deem Suntory. That same, at that same time period, this is an email that we received from one of the distributors of that bulk rye whiskey coming from MGP, offering to sell us a bottle of rye whiskey for $2.75 a bottle. Now, this is the same rye that's on state store shelves for somewhere between $25 and $50 a bottle. You do not need an MBA to know there is a lot of margin between $2.75 and $50 on shelf, right? And when we saw this, we looked at this and said, this looks like margin that's built on consumer confusion. And we want to build a company whose value increases as consumer education and transparency increases, because this is untenable. The other thing that happens when you have an industry that's relying on two sources of its whiskey instead of an industry that's made up of thousands of different distilleries is you lose a lot of the interesting components that go into what makes a whiskey taste um, as it does. So here are just some of the things that go into how a whiskey tastes. There's where the grains are grown, what the mash bill is, the climate, the um, rain, the soil, the fermentation style at the distillery, the number of days, the yeast we're using, the temperature, the equipment, the distillation, the type of still, the cuts the distillers are making, which are judgment calls. Um, the, and then finally, of course, the aging, how long something sits in a barrel, what size barrel that is, where the barrel exists, and what the whiskey is proofed down to. If everyone is buying whiskey, though, from the same two suppliers, the same rye whiskey, you eliminate a lot of the differentiators and flavor. And all you're left with to talk with consumers about is how long the whiskey's been in a barrel and what proof you're bottling it at. And maybe the water that you're using to bottle it. And what has been marketed in whiskey for the last 80 years? Exactly these two things. When was the last time you had a conversation with someone about the soil that the grains your whiskey was grown in, were grown in, or the cuts the distillers made in the whiskey. No one markets that, right? There wasn't a lot of differentiation in that. So when we started the distillery, we really wanted to focus on bringing back this taste of place. So we made a lot of commitments when we started. We said we're gonna use regional ingredients because if we wanna make Pennsylvania Monongahela rye, we gotta use Pennsylvania Monongahela rye grain, right? Um, we were gonna, we committed to being certified organic because we knew that we were gonna have a pretty big environmental impact in terms of our state's agriculture and we wanted to be as responsible as possible about that. We were gonna use a pot still, do alembic runs, which was pretty rare in the, in the United States um, at the time. And we were never going to buy any of those bulk spirits. Um, I might, I'm gonna go, how many people are really into whiskey here? All right, we're just going to do it. Let's do it. All right, so this is a graph. And for the rest of you, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a graph that shows at the turn of the century what Western Pennsylvania is growing in terms of rye grain. And this is, we're growing a lot of rye, right, pre-prohibition. And this is to support the whiskey industry. What's more interesting than this, though, is when we look at how good we are, at growing rye grain, we were crap. We were so bad. This is a chart that shows fecundity per acre, right? How good at you are growing rye. And when we looked at this, we said, 
Oh my gosh, this reminds us a lot of this notion in winemaking called hormesis, where you put grapes in a really stressful environment and it produces more flavor in those grapes and in the ultimate wine. We thought, hey, maybe there's something to this about where that Monongahela rye, that spicy, earthy flavor that became known around the world, maybe it had something to do with um, our region, the topography, the climate, the grains we were growing. So we spent a couple years trying to bear this out. Um, we did this experiment where we grabbed rye from um, a number of different farms across the rye belt in the United States and produced singular batches from those um, from those rye harvests, had them tested, did GC analysis on the raw distillate, and then the distillate after one year in a barrel, and after two years in a barrel, to see if there were indeed regional differences in uh, the compounds that we got out of the whiskey. And we saw that, in fact, Pennsylvania rye grain appears to produce some pretty interesting, unique flavors. So this ethyl acetate produces um, a flavor that consumers perceive as apple or pear. And then I think this one's really interesting. The isobutanol is what, when consumers taste isobutanol, they describe it as rye bread. And those popped off the chart for our Pennsylvania uh, rye. And so this gave us some notion that, hey, we think there really is something to this regionality in spirits that our country has been missing now for 100 years. Now, to have those kinds of conversations, though, where we're talking about grain, we really need our customers close. There's so much education and engagement that's required to sell whiskey at that level, right? And the way the industry was set up didn't really allow for those kinds of conversations to happen. Because if we were going to start a distillery in the traditional mold, what we should have done was found a manufacturing spot in the excerpts in some cheap warehouse, focused on a singular product, produced it as efficiently as possible, and distributed it as widely as possible. And this is what the two craft distilleries that preceded us in Pennsylvania did. And they're both distilleries that we admire. Um, one of them, if anyone, is anyone from Philadelphia? Great. I actually love Philadelphia. It's just for the joke. I do it for the whole house. It's a great town. Um, but Philly Distilling that produces Blue Coat Gin. I'm sure everyone is aware of, if you're a gin drinker, you are aware of Blue Coat Gin. They were the first, we were not the first distillery in the state of Pennsylvania. They were the very first, and they set up just exactly in this model, which very much mimics our Diageo, right? This is how Diageo does it. We looked at this bottle and said, man, to be like that, Diageo is going to beat us every single day at sales and marketing. We're going to lose this game. So instead of playing this game, let's try to change the game. So instead of focusing on a singular, widely distributed product, producing as efficiently as possible, we focus 10% of our production on innovation, which means we are trying to bring a dedicated, loyal group of consumers back and back again to us over and over through education and programming and innovation. Now, this means that we wanted to build our distillery not in the excerpts, but right smack dab in the middle of the city in a very visitable place. So we started doing that in 2010. I graduated from Tepper in 2010, took a job at Heinz and while um, I worked my day job, at night we were building out this distillery. Uh, we had, uh, we contracted with a still maker outside of Munich um, who built the copper still for us over the course of a year and a half. And then we had it shipped over. At the same time we were building out the distillery in the strip, we were also lobbying to change the Pennsylvania law because at this point this model was not legal in our state. So this law that we, um, this bill that we put forward was ultimately passed 
uh, in December of 2011, and that allowed us to sample and sell our products directly to consumers so that we could have those very conversations that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and we <coughs> opened the doors after the public comment period ended in March of 2012 as the first distillery, um, the first whiskey distillery in the state. Now, um, one of the sort of really interesting things about owning a whiskey business is just how stupid it is from a business model. <laughs> um, you have to be quite patient. So, you know, our inventory now sits in barrels for about, on average, about five years. That's what we target. So the vast majority of what we produce each year, we will not sell for at least five years. Something like 90% of what we uh, make every year just hangs out. It's quite a bit to carry. Um, we really focused, if you know, on our consumers. This is sort of how we think about our core consumers. Um, we started with. Uh, this is Jill. She's a staff. I use staff members and close partners because I didn't have to get their permission. Um, this is Jill. She's, she does our PR, but she um, she's an Epicurean. She loves flavor. She loves great food, wine, beer. She loves all of it. She's very smart. She's also a Carnegie Mellon grad. Um, and she was really our first target consumer. Um, people like Jill. And then we started being able to pull in, this is Pete, He's, this is his staff photo. He chose to look like a criminal. Um, <laughs> he, came from the, he came to us from the craft beer world. He worked for Flying Dog, a craft brewery in Maryland for five years before he moved to Pittsburgh and started working for Wiggle. And we started bringing in people like him through partnerships with regional breweries and through really innovative production methodologies around yeast and things that people who love craft beer can really get their heads around. And we always knew that this is Max, that someone like Max was going to be our hardest get. Because Max has been a scotch and bourbon drinker for quite a while. <coughs> and he has lots of brand loyalty. He will explore, but it has to be within a certain realm of whiskeys. And so there are certain things to him that are quite important, um, including the number on the bottle, the age. And so he, we now are able to talk effectively and engage effectively with consumers like Max. But we did not set out in year one to convince Max, right? We always knew that. Max was going to have to hear from five of his close whiskey friends that he trusts that Wiggle was worthwhile before he got on board. Come back. Um, so all that has worked out fairly well for us. And now in Pittsburgh, we have um, five Wiggle sites. We have the distillery and the strip. We're um, just eight days away from completing a three and a half million dollar expansion project. So we hope you'll visit us in uh, March. Don't come right now, come in March. <laughs> um, someone brought a bad Google review the other day for us at the distillery because they were like, the parking lot's a mess, there's construction crews everywhere. And I called them at work because that's what I do. And I said, I know, it is such a mess. I am so sorry. Please come back in March. <laughs> so come visit us in March. Um, we have a barrel house on the north side, which is where we age. We actually have two barrel houses on the north side, but this was our first one. We age our whiskeys in there, and in the spring through summer, we open it up um, for, we have a bar there, and we do lots of community programs and live music. We have a a uh, tasting room downtown in the Omni William Penn Hotel on Oliver Avenue, so next to the Starbucks there. Um, and we have, uh, this is our mall site. We have a site at Ross Park Mall in the North Hills and one at the airport as well. So we have these sites where consumers can come and we get to hang out with them directly. And then we're also distributed in about 12 states 
um, and of course throughout the state of Pennsylvania through state stores. Um, this is a picture of our distillery and construction. Um, some of the things that I'm proudest of about Wiggle, uh, we buy a ton of grain now and we've brought a number of fallow farms back online um, in Pennsylvania and we've converted um, a number of farms from conventional to organic practices. I don't know if you guys saw the Michelob commercial in the Super Bowl. They were talking about, I think they made a claim, if, when you buy a six pack of Michelob organic beer, you put something like six acres of American farmland um, into organic hands. And I should have figured out what the conversion is for us, but it would be much higher because you distill down that grain into a bottle. Um, so that's, that feels good for us. Um, we have 150 people, and we were the first uh, company in the state to sign on to the Voluntary Living Wage Program that the governor introduced. Um, and we, you know, community development was my background before this, and so investing in our neighborhoods is um, very important to us. A few years ago, we started a sister company called Threadbare, and we started Threadbare really in the same model as we started Wiggle. We wanted to tell a regional story, this time around Johnny Chapman, Johnny Appleseed, who was a Pittsburgher who lived at the same time as Philip Wiggle in Pittsburgh. They would have been neighbors downtown. Uh, Johnny Appleseed gathered apple seeds from the banks of the Monongahela River, took them westward to set up orchards for frontiers people moving west. Growing these apple trees from seed does not produce eating apples, it produces hard cider apples. Uh, and he grew apple trees from seed because he thought that grafting, which is when you cut off a piece of a tree and grow a new tree from that graft, um, that's how you would produce culinary apples that are sweeter, um, better for eating. He thought that that grafting process hurt the tree's souls. So instead he grew these trees from seeds. He was a pretty interesting guy, a vegetarian on the frontier in the 1790s. Gave away all of his money to animal causes, what we would think of as horse rescues. Farmers that took in horses beyond their usable lives and cared for them. Um, so we wanted to tell his story, and we wanted to celebrate this other piece of Pennsylvania agriculture, which um, are apples. Uh, so we opened up our cider house on the north side uh, two and a half years ago. And we have another site now at uh, Rock Park Mall. Um, and this is our mall site. And our cider bottles are available throughout the state in both Giant Eagle stores and PLCB state stores, <coughs> and then we're distributed in pretty much the same footprint as uh, Wiggle spirits are distributed. So about a dozen states across the country. And that is all I've got, my friends. <laughs> so I would love to take any questions. John, I'll start with my neighbor. All right, this is more of feedback for, for Wiggle. It has an international reputation I learned on the way over here. One of oh. my colleagues told me he bought Wiggle whiskey for visitors from Japan. Oh, I love that. So it, it is expanding. That's great. We, we went and made a Pittsburgh reputation. My husband and I and Effie went to Japan, our daughter, um, I don't know, a few years ago, and she was, I don't know, in preschool or kindergarten at the time, and we walked onto the subway the first day we got there, and she had like the equivalent of a Slurpee, a sequined American flag t-shirt, and I can you not, she started singing the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, a huge fan. Aww. Aww. Yeah. Mike, I'm sorry for all the construction. Thank you. We, we will invite you to the preview party. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think there's something I'm already invited to. Okay, got it. There's some March. Good. When I sold there using the new section. But you guys have so many different products. We do. I mean, you've got to have more products than, than Diageo. I mean, it's unbelievable how many different things you have in the shelf. So 
I was wondering, like, the groundhog whiskey that you're giving out, like, mm -hmm. what happened? I mean, I guess it can, it has a long shelf life. Yes. I don't know how long. No, it actually, you know what, that's so, oh, I'm sorry, finish yeah, so your question. Just, what's the strategy behind having so many products? Because you think you would have a lot of unsold inventory as a mm -hmm. result. Yeah, so, um, I have this other talk that I do where I talk about our crazy, unwieldy portfolio, and I can talk about that for a long time. So I'm going to try to condense that. But we really think about innovation in three ways. So the first and sort of most critical piece to innovation at Wiggle and Threadbare um, is continuous improvement, right? Continual tinkering with our core products. And we, our core products, we have five core products that we distribute throughout the country, right? If you go to New York City, you're not gonna see our crazy portfolio in New York City. You're gonna see the same five products that you see in Boston that you see in Baltimore. Um, the second piece of our innovation is what we call our long cycle innovation. And that is very consumer driven. So, and we produce one or two products a year in that cycle of innovation. And that starts with us asking consumers every year, at the beginning of the year, what do you want to see from us in the next five years? And then going through a lot of consumer work throughout the year to bring them along in the cycle so that we know we are producing two marketable products, one or two. And that process generally takes us um, 12 to 16 months of innovation work and then however long it needs to be in barrels for. And then we have a third sort of tier of innovation um, that gives us this volume of innovation, which we think of our, as our fast cycle innovation. And those projects are very internally driven. We're not talking to consumers about them. They're either scratching uh, production members itch, like I love Amari, and I have this idea for a Pennsylvania Amari that uses apple brandy and you know these the it, traditional italian spice and and i just want to do it and we say okay you've got six months before we kill it let's see what you can do or it's this thing where i said i fucking love groundhogs <laughs> wouldn't it be really cool <laughs> if phil would come to the distillery and the original idea was phil i don't know how much you know about groundhog phil <laughs> but he's well, over, I mean, he's well into his 130s. I think he's 137. And he continues this, this life by drinking um, an elixir of life each year. Mm -hmm. And the original idea was, I want to produce Phil's elixir of life. <laughs> and then I got the inner circle down to Pittsburgh, which are those guys in the top hats, in the tuxedos, who, they're Phil's entourage. They care for him. And they were very no-nonsense. They said, no, 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 the elixir of life is not alcoholic, and this is not appropriate, but we would like to make a whiskey with you. And so these products, these are beautiful because they are newsworthy, they keep people interested, they give us reasons to bring people back, um, they, you know, are pathways to partnerships for us, but this won't sit on shelf all year, right? This is, we do a single batch of this for Groundhog's Day. It gets distributed in Pennsylvania only. Um, we take it up to Punxsutawney. We're part of the celebrations. And then we have about five bottles of this left this year. And it'll disappear. Uh, so that's an example of fast cycle innovation. So these are not intended to be um, market sustaining products for us. But, but sometimes you stumble on something. Oh, we do. I think you were thinking of your, the saffron tomorrow. Mm -hmm. which yes, is, is it's beautiful. It's and I see it around. Yeah. And it's amazing. Thank you. That actually took us a whim. We think of these fast cycle products as whims, is what we call them internally. And they are supposed to not be cap, like not huge capex projects. They're supposed to, you know, be able to live and go, and no one cries over them and that kind of thing. That Amaro project, and it was like three and a half years. There was a lot of tears over that one. <laughs> like, but generally, they're not supposed to be that hard. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just curious. Um, based on how you describe it, you make 
you, you sell after like five years, like the, the aging and the shelf life. Um, how does the, I guess, the unit economics work out for your profits? Like how do you make money? How do you make money? Yeah, it's it. I mean, really, this business is so uniquely challenging. Um, the economics of it. I mean, there are some other businesses that you can think of that are sort of like some cheese makers have the same dilemma, where they're aging cheese for three years. Or, but this is a pretty stupid way to try to make money quickly. If you were going to start a distillery to sell within eight to 10 years, which is what smarter people than I do. Um, and I'm not saying that facetiously. I'm really, truly, if you were smarter than me, that's what you would do. You would buy bulk spirit that's already aged, create a beautiful brand, a beautiful backstory, and just distribute the shit out of it. Build an enormous sales force and get huge growth numbers for the first three years and then try to sell the brand. That doesn't always work. But the big exits, that's what they've been. This is a slow growth model. This is like what Dave wishes like I would not do, right? Because I'm never going to put my name on a building here. But, but I get to make really great whiskey. Yeah. From this talk, the tagline that I get is, the whiskey business is a people business, and wow, how important is the story behind it? Mm -hmm. That being said, uh, do you see any applications or paths to include technology, specifically like machine learning or some other learning algorithms to find the variables and create paths of exploration that maybe people don't think about? It's funny you should ask. I actually just got, um, John, I should have asked you for um, what book I should have gotten, but I just started reading this machine learning textbook last night. It's after we get out of probability, all bets are off. <laughs> um, but I think there's definitely opportunities there, for sure. We tried, several years ago, we worked with a robotics institute here and um, a student, a very gifted student here on a robotic malting setup, which ultimately um, didn't make sense, just the capital required for it. But there's certainly opportunities either in the consumer preference area or in the production area, I'm sure, for machine learning. Hello, hi. How are you? Good. Uh, if it takes years to get to market for whiskey, how can you measure the success of it or know if it will be successful on, like, when you start making it? Yeah, the, you're talking about the actual product performance, how it tastes. How do you tell when the whiskey that you're making now you won't be able to sell for five years, three years, or whatever. Well, you can certainly taste it along the way, and you can taste it right off the still. So, in fact, everything we make, we're tasting through cuts. It's called cuts off the still. So, whiskey and other spirits come out in three parts called the heads, the hearts, and the tails. And the heads are the stuff that moonshiners who go blind, they're drinking the heads. You don't want that stuff. That's the methanol and all the other stuff that gives you um, bad health. Um, the hearts and the tails are the interesting part of the distillate. And so the hearts are the heart of the whiskey. It's where the most of the volume of the whiskey comes from. The tails are like um, spice and food or fat and meat. You want some of them in your whiskey because it gives it body and character and flavor. But if you put too much, you can overwhelm the spirit. So scotch makers use a lot of tails. Irish whiskey makers use very few tails. American whiskey makers traditionally are somewhere in between those two. And so to make those cuts, to make those determinations, you're tasting the whiskey right off the still, and you're getting pretty skilled at understanding what those flavors going into the barrel mean You know, several years later when they come out of the barrel. Um, that's certainly a learning process. We've been doing it for 10 years now. Um, we've learned a lot about that. Um, but I think even actually, if you think back to the slide I showed in our rye experiment, the GC analysis of raw distillate, of the cogeners in the raw distillate versus one year in a barrel versus two years in a barrel across all those different batches, they stayed pretty constant. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, okay. 
I mean, it's not perfect, but you can definitely have an educated understanding of what something will translate to after X number of years in oak. Yeah? You mentioned that in your development cycle, one or two items per year are based upon consumer feedback. Yeah. What channels do you use to gather that information, and how do you decide which angles to attack? Yeah, so we have um, a pretty robust um, consumer um, engagement sort of method that we use. So it, it's become fairly standardized. So in the beginning of the year, we ask, we poll internally, everyone, all of our staff members and tour guides, anyone who touches the distillery really, for their best and brightest ideas um, in a huge brainstorm. And at that point, we're just looking for a volume of product ideas. We're not, you know, it's definitely quantity over quality at that point. Then we do the same thing. We ask um, our consumers either through our e-blast to fill out um, what they want to see or through social media. Uh, and then we do an idea screen where we pick out what we think are the most promising ideas, the most 10 or 15 most promising. We field the idea screen, which is just a sentence about what this product is. We put that out to consumers and try to get statistically significant feedback. We ask three questions. Um, how interesting is this, is this to you? How unique is it to you? How likely are you to purchase that? And now we have a decade of benchmark data where we have the scores of all prior products against their market success or not. So we can sort of get a pretty good projection of how successful a product idea might be. And then that's where the rubber hits the road. We take the top performing items there and we say, okay, at this point, can we actually develop against any of these? Are there regulatory issues? Are there um, uh, equipment issues that we can't get around? And at that point, we would eliminate anything that's just not feasible. But we don't even think about feasibility until that point. Uh, and then uh, at that point, we start bringing consumers in regularly for uh, development tastings, for beta tastings. Uh, we don't, you know, we keep it blind for months. We bring the same groups back and back and back. Is that part of the cut cycle that you mentioned earlier? No, this is, it depends on what the product is, but it's, you know, just us developing prototypes of the products, comparing it to whoever we think the category leaders are or the best in class in the seg segment is, um, and having consumer groups come in, try it, try it, um, without revealing what's ours. Um, and then after a number of months, uh, once we start getting what we feel like are really good responses on the product, then we start going even deeper with consumers on some of the details. They learn more about how we're making it, um, what we're doing. Uh, and then once we have beaten in consumer preferences in these group formats, whoever we think the category leader is or the gold standard is, once consumers are telling us that our product is performing better than that, then we field it to uh, a much wider audience to get a truly quantitative result. And if we perform better than whoever we think the category gold standard is, then we release it. Um, I was wondering with it being such a capital intensive project, uh, what the fundraising journey was like if you had to raise money and um, how, that, how you went about that process. Yeah, so the question is about, question? Yep, the question is about how to get the money, fundraising. So this is not, in the beginning it's not a bankable business, right? So it's all friends and family, it's all private investments, um, and this is, like I said, a slow growth business. There's no, there's no hockey stick here. So this is not interesting to venture capital firms, or, and nor would we want it to be interesting to them. Um, so non-traditional is the way to go here. Um, but now we have a very bankable business because we have an extraordinary amount of assets. The whiskey business, you know, the business is in our whiskey warehouses where we have uh, barrels upon barrels of assets. 
So now every bank would want to finance us. Um, we've got a ton of collateral. Hi, um, I'm a huge fan of your products. Oh, and thanks. You on your See you. From um, and uh, I was just wondering, from going to the other distilleries around, I know that you know, whiskey was the first one, and they also talk about, um, when I talk to the owners and people working there, how much you've been helpful with helping to start their businesses. Can you speak to like, the collaboration that you have with the other distilleries in the Pittsburgh area? Yeah, the um, questions about collaboration. You know, this is hard, I think, for any entrepreneur is you, you know, this balance between building your own business and building a community. And our perspective on it from the start has always been we are trying to do something bigger than just this distillery. We are trying to bring back this regional identity to Western Pennsylvania. And that is where the strength for our company will live. That is where the strength for other distilleries, too, will live. But the reason a distillery in Kentucky is as strong as it is, is because it's a part of this larger Kentucky story and Kentucky Trail. And any one of those distilleries, if you move them out of Kentucky and put them solo in another state, would not be nearly as successful, right? Because they don't have this um, community. It's the same principle as why you know, the sports center is set up in this way. Um, so we've, we've, you know, we had enormously collaborative partners from the start in the existing distilleries that existed in the state, the Philly Distillery, um, Mountain Laurel Spirits outside of Philly as well. And we've tried to continue that same culture. So the latest effort um, for the past three years, I've spent trying to build this uh, Whiskey Rebellion Trail and we launched it last July. And it's a trail that connects 75 uh, distilleries and cultural institutions from um, in the Mid-Atlantic. So from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh to Baltimore, um, Washington, DC. So it includes all the craft distilleries in that um, area that exist, as well as you know Mount Vernon and the Smithsonian and the Heinz History Center and Museum of the American Revolution. Um, and that has been an extraordinary um, adventure. And I got to do, you know, I led this press trip last July where I got to visit all of these distilleries, many of which, you know, have just opened up in the past few years. And it was so fun to see the diversity of distilleries and how all of these businesses really reflect the entrepreneurs that started them and their personalities. Uh, it was just such a cool experience. It, um, I don't know, it, it sort of refreshes your view of how a diverse <coughs> marketplace can be so exhilarating. Yeah? Um, you know, this was a pretty audacious vision. So you're starting out something that was capital intensive, long term, uh, nobody else was doing. How did you kind of have the vision to do it and the confidence to do it? Yeah, we didn't, um, I don't, honestly, don't know. Um, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know how, why, or how <laughs> we, but so my husband and I both really wanted to do something in craft alcohol and we wanted to do something all as a family and we pitched this idea to my parents who were just about to embark on retirement and we knew my dad could not sit still, and so this might be something that he could get into too. And one of my brothers was just getting out of a fellowship on the West Coast, and so we sort of pitched it to him too. And, and then at that point, we had this sort of quorum of people who were all saying, yeah, I think this could be fun. But then, it, you know, all the time we were lobbying, we were pouring money into this space, and you know, we were, we were worried. We were worried. I mean, we would have these, the most ridiculous meetings where we would sit around every week, every Thursday night, we'd sit around the kitchen table and we'd say, what's our plan B? And we never came up with a plan B. We just never had a plan B. And I think maybe that's part of the reason it worked. It's just, it just had to work. It had to work. And then, you know, once we opened the distillery, like my last day at Heinz was a Friday. I left at noon. I walked down to the distillery in the strip. My mom 
brought my daughter from daycare. I had her in the thing, holding her, and we had a line of like 200 people out the door, and we were totally ill-prepared. We had no freaking clue what we were doing. Totally ill-prepared. Um, and then we realized, oh, we're gonna have to like actually quit our jobs. <laughs> and then we, you know, my husband was a corporate lawyer. I was a, in brand management at Heinz, and we both quit, and you know, you go from two six-figure jobs to vo essentially volunteering for a number of years to get it. I mean, you asked about the money. You live on $20,000 a year until you get it going. That's, about, that's how you do it. That's the funding. <laughs> you fund it. <laughs> um, and you just have to get through that. You just have to get through that period. Yeah. So I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. If I were doing it, I, it would be hard to do that again at this point in my life. <laughs> Anything else? Um, how much did you rely on just following what was happening in the craft beer scene beforehand? And I know like maybe some other distilleries in other states had already done it. So yeah. were you following those models? Absolutely. So we, the West Coast, Portland and parts of California, not all of California, they were sort of the first wave, of course, of a lot of beer. Um, and the first wave of craft distilling happened 20 years ago, and it was like all these brandy producers in California, but they never got off the ground because they were making beautiful products which were based on all the fruits that they grow in California, but Americans don't drink brandy, so it was just sort of ill-fated from the start. So we looked at all of that, and then we said, okay, the craft beer thing is working. The brandy did not work. But we think there's something here, and we're in the right region to do whiskey from a story perspective and a reason to be. Um, so we visited an enormous amount of breweries. We thought about doing a brewery here. Scott Smith, who owns Easton Brewing, is a very good friend. And um, was, you know, 10 years ago when he was just starting his brewery as well. And we thought that, this sounds crazy now, but we thought that craft beer was saturated 10 years ago. Um, it wasn't. <laughs> what was your uh, rollout strategy? Did you source at the very beginning, or did you just sell new make and like focus on making craft cocktails? Yeah. Until you had like at least a two year, three year uh, in the barrel? Yeah, we sold um, New Make, exactly. We've never bought any spirit, even for our gin. We make all of our, which is sort of silly, but it is what we do. Um, so we um, made, sold New Make. I developed our gin within the first year, and then I developed our rum within the second year. And then we were able to start releasing um, aged whiskey um, at some point in between there. Uh, but I'll tell you, selling white whiskey, if you want a marketing and sales challenge, if you can sell white whiskey, we can sell Well, now it was, and now it's actually one of the most welcoming places. This is one of the best places to operate a craft distillery now. Um, because of your work, I'm sure. Well, yeah, and you know, the state store has been very supportive of local distilleries. I mean, but yes, it was us. So um, in the beginning, uh, my dad worked really hard at the lobbying. Now I do the lobbying. Um, and. For instance, last year I spent the year working on um, getting some uh, this program through the state that allowed us to do this expansion in the strip district. And I went through this process of interviewing um, all of the city's best lobbyists, right? I, they came down to the distillery and they would tell me 
their credentials and how they were going to go about it. And like one guy that I interviewed, he's so good at his job. He's so good at his job. He was like, I got nine of my last 11 projects funded. Those are pretty good odds, right? That's like, he was like, uh, I was like, how much do you cost? $60,000. So, Okay, 60,000 and 90%. <laughs> right, it makes sense, right? This, it, it, would made, it would have made sense to hire him, absolutely. But I walked out of that meeting thinking, I'm gonna do it. I need this so bad. You're gonna go back to that fancy office, looking out on the city. Some days you're gonna be a little depressed about your life. You're just gonna think about how you feel sorry for yourself. Some days you're gonna go fancy on just, I'm going to work my fucking ass off the next 12 months to make sure I get this because I have no other option. I've already told everyone we're doing this expansion and we don't have the money to do it. I have to get this. And so I do buy a lot. And it turns out it's just having conversations with people, right? It's just how many coffees can you have in a year? A lot. Like 79. Yeah.